no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. So most people are out on that, right? You're like, you're doing something that you don't have to do and it gets painful. Oh, I'm done. So, so no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, why is it that yo-yo dieters always gain the weight back? Is it the fact that their why is less compelling than the how? In today's episode, we chat to Chad Canilla, entrepreneur and author of Finding Happy, 10 Keys to an Extraordinary Life. You will come away with practical keys to not only achieving your goals, but maintaining and soaring above them. Let's dive in. Welcome to Rewrite Your Story, the podcast where change begins with you. We're your hosts, Stephen and Charlene. As professional coaches and mentors trained in various modalities, we have helped hundreds of people. Bridge the gap between the person they are and the person they want to be. We bring you conversations with real people who have overcome real setbacks. You will walk away with practical steps to find more clarity, alignment and success in any area you want to improve. So join us and discover how you have the power to overcome, to change and to rewrite your story. So pick up the pen. Your new chapter starts now. So Chad, you've got a really interesting background as in you've done a lot of things. You're creative, you're an entrepreneur. And I would say by knowing you for a little while, your life is quite fulfilled. My question is, what is the biggest misconception people have when trying to create that fulfilling life? Yeah, well, thank, thanks. Great question. I think for me, the biggest min- misconception is just thinking it's going to be easy peasy, lemon squeezy, you know, like, oh, I've got an idea. I want it to look like this. And then you spend about a day or two or a month or two, and you're just going to have it because it just doesn't work out like that. It's a journey. It's a process. It's a fight. It's like building anything in life, right? Whether you're trying to build muscles or build your bank account or build a family, it takes time. So if you were to break um, down like the the whole extraordinary living, how would you break that down in um, everyday practical terms? Yeah. So for me, extraordinary living is just walking on a path that you're proud of, that's fulfilling, that you look in the mirror every day and you say, did I spend my day wisely? It's looking in the mirror and feeling pretty dang good about what you did. And you know, it's developing a life of significance. I think a lot of people internally, we want that, but we don't know it. You know, I chased a lot of different types of dreams when I was younger that I was, I'd get there and I'd be left holding an empty bag that just didn't have the happiness in there that I thought would be there. And then we see that all the time, right? With, uh, you know, whether it's professional musicians or actors or people that have what we would say fame and success. And then you find out they killed themselves or they're so depressed and you think, why? They seem to be, you know, they're they're wealthy, they're rich, but it doesn't always equate to happiness. So, you know, just uh, really just looking at your family, looking in the mirror and going, man, I feel good about where I am in life right now. Yeah. Wow. So really um, putting meaning into what you do and not just looking for happiness, just for the sake of happiness. Yes. Yeah. Meaning, you know, I think it was Martin, Martin, uh, some author, he basically said, there's two amazing days in your life, the day you're born and the day you find out why. And I think a lot of people just kind of drift through life and they don't think that way. They don't think about why am I here? But when you figure out why you're here and you get to operate in that space, It's just you live a life of significance then. And significance is far better than any type of success. How has fatherhood and how has marriage impacted happiness? And and what were some of the challenges, you know, in writing this book that you're reflecting back and like, wow, I I wish I knew that when I first got married or I wish I knew that when I was first a dad. Tell us about that journey with you. Well, for me, it was all it was all an experiment, honestly, Mm -hmm. because I didn't when I got married, I didn't really have a good role model. You know, I didn't have people that had had what I would say would be the model marriage. And then when we started getting involved with church, I had this. So I thought there was reality here, which I had kind of experienced with my parents and family and people around me. And then there was up here that seemed pie in the sky. You know, some of the pastors I knew, and I'll never forget, I sat down with one pastor and I said, how is your life so perfect? How come you and your wife never get in a fight? And he, he started like laughing like a hyena. And he was like, I was yelling at my wife last night. I was like, what? You're yelling at your wife? And. And so there was just this, this reality, but for me, it was a learning curve. And we, we tell our 19 year old that he was our first experiment because, you know, we wanted to learn. I didn't want to raise my children exactly like I was raised. And my wife was the same way. So like, okay, the formula is simple. You go find some really great kids that you have spend some time with and you know, they're great. And then you go find their parents and you say, how did you do that? Like, we like the product. We, we like how your kid turned out. So can you kind of tell me what should I read? How should, what should I do? 
And so that process of that pursuing of, of wisdom and understanding was uh, instrumental. I mean, for my wife and I, when we first got together, our, one of our first decisions was we need to get around good people. Where do we find them? We argued for five months of what kind of church we'd go to, but we kind of agreed there's probably some good people at church. Let's start there. And so that led us to getting away from our hometown and going and starting our own family on our own. So we could just start from a clean slate, got involved with the church, started doing small groups, met some great couples. And then just learned a lot. You know, we were willing to say, okay, what I've been taught may not be the best way to do this in marriage or parenting. And so let's start with a clean slate and really be open to how to do this the right way. And, you know, and I'm, we're really proud of our, our children. We've got a 19 year old son, a 16 year old daughter and a 13 year old son. And for the most part, they've uh, done very, very well. And we're really proud of everything they've, that's happened in their life so far. So, but a lot of uh, the marriage was a lot of a uh, trial and error, you know? <laughs> In a, a, a lot of iron sharpening iron, some big yeah. fights and things like that. But it's funny, though, you talk to anybody that's been married a long time. They'll say, we've been married about 25 years and probably 15 of them were really good. <laughs> it's so true. So true. And, you know, your book, you speak about 10 keys, the 10 keys of finding happiness. And I'm really curious, what is your interpretation of the 10 keys? Yeah. So for me, it's the little, it's, it's kind of like the slight edge, right? It, it's a philosophy. You know, it's just simple philosophies that if you live by these philosophies, they're going to make your life a little better. They're going to make you a little happier, like dreaming big. You know, one of them's dreaming big. One of them's always having hope. You know, there's people out there that say, don't get your hopes up. And, and what a horrible philosophy that is. Cause if you don't have hope, then what we have to look forward to tomorrow. I mean, in, in my opinion, I think the best should always be coming. Like, Enjoy what you have while you pursue all that you want. Be happy with where you are, but understanding that it's even going to get better, right? Because if you think that you're a one-hit wonder or back in your college football days was the best days of your life, then it makes it kind of tough yeah. just, just to live life. So believing in other people, you know, I think uh, selfish people end up very not happy. And uh, people who are givers, you know, when you give, you actually, you're stretching your hands out and it begins the receiving process. And so just little, little things like that, you know, relationships, cultivating relationships. I mean, some need to be uh, cultivated, some need to be initiated, some need to be terminated sometimes, but it's just understanding your relationships and being disciplined. I mean, Hebrews 12, 11 talks about discipline and, and then basically it says that although discipline seems to be difficult at the time that it pays dividends and it pays rewards over time. So it's not. It's not that one moment of being disciplined. It's a lifestyle. It's just doing what you said you would do. I mean, it's being who you want other people to be, right? The golden rule. Like if I'm going to ask you to honor your commitments, then I better be honoring my commitments. And I better be modeling that to my wife and modeling that to my kids. Otherwise, I'm a hypocrite and I just don't want to be a hypocrite. So growing in wisdom, always growing, you know, because you go through, when you're having a baby, you go through growing labor, growing pains. And when you're a kid and you're getting taller, growth spurs, right? So growing is something that just should never stop. And as long as we're learning and we're growing, that we're happier because of that. We're like a river instead of like a, a pond that just sits there and kind of gets stale. Yeah, that's brilliant. And, and it's, you know, that like you've really touched on some, you know, home truths there. Like, you're so right. People don't have hope these days. And, and people, you know, like if you look at the major discussions, it's always tainted towards the negative side, like the cost of living and and things like that and and people complaints, complaints. so mm. uh, you know not having that hope mm. is is so important but i also feel like sometimes people say that or they have this thing in their head that it's like almost a self-preservation thing that they don't want to get disappointed if nothing actually happens you know what i mean <laughs> but then you know mm -hmm. like how do you balance that like still have hope but that's in like a way that they are doing things that can actually have control over rather than just Having this pie in the sky is sort of hard. Yeah, I read a book one time called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Yeah. And one of the habits is begin with the end in mind. And there's a there's a basically an exercise to go through there. And I went through it. I took soldiers to it. I've taken people through it over the years. And it helped me out so much. It was literally like close your eyes and picture you're at a funeral. And you go up there and in the casket and you see it's you. So here you are at your own funeral. You get to stand in the back of the room. You get to hear what your spouse says about you. You get to hear what each of your kids say about you your parents, your family, your friends, everyone. 
And then the, the concept of it all is, hey, you get to determine that now. You get to make choices now where it's not going to be a surprise. Like if you want them to have to rent out the biggest building in town, you can ensure that happens by serving a lot of people, like helping a lot of people. And so for me, going through that exercise, it helped me kind of highlight the most important parts of life, which are those key relationships, right? And just pouring into them and sowing into them and leaving people better than you found them because- some people, I, you, know, you kind of wonder, will they get the six? Will they have enough people to carry their coffin? Because they've done a whole lot. Yeah. You know, it's like serve and help. How do you balance your own personal happiness with the responsibility of others? So how do you how do you take that approach where you know I'm responsible for my happiness? I'm not necessarily responsible for these other people I'm serving and their reaction to my happiness, because sometimes when you know, we choose happiness, not everyone is on board. So there's a, there's a couple of pieces there. So first of all, I'm, I don't really personally believe in balance because I think I believe in seasons and, you know, I could say I'm balanced and then someone in my house gets sick and they're in the hospital and I'm sitting there at their hospital bed for a week and, and that's just going to become my focus. So I believe in alignment, right? So, so as a Christian, first of all, I have to be connected with my father and have to be totally dialed in there because I'm no good. If I'm empty, I have nothing to give. So first of all, I have to be full. And then out of that overflow, I get to pour into my wife. And then out of that overflow, I get to pour into my children. And then I get to pour into family and friends and business. So that's, I always make sure that I've got, that I've got that alignment that's set up. And then understanding too, that every person isn't my assignment. Just because they come along and they need me, they want my time, they want my energy, I'm always weighing that against the cost because there's always a cost, right? There's a cost to mentor somebody. There's a cost to give your energy and your time to somebody. And you hit a point in life where you just can't, if you want to be a great you know, spouse and you want to be a great father and you want to be great at these different things, you have to, and I'm always asking, Lord, is this my assignment? Because if the person's not, then I don't want to put any energy or time there because that's just not my season for that person. And so Sometimes it's making sure that people, when you're when you're going to mentor someone, are they teachable? Are they willing to put in the work? And you know, are, are they applying it? Because if they're not, then I don't want to, I don't want to, I just don't want to waste time. Especially the older I get, I think you guys would relate too. Because the older we get, it's like the more you see the clock's ticking. Yeah. You're like, oh my gosh, my time is becoming more and more and more valuable, and I just don't waste it like I did when I was younger. Yeah. Yeah. Chad, you're you're very successful in your own right. You know, you're you're an entrepreneur. You've developed a, a few streams of income to support your family. And, you know, I love the fact that you're talking about alignment and working with those that you really want to work with. My question is, what was your biggest aha moment when it came to all of this? You know, when it came to this is the one piece that makes me or, or fulfills my happiness. And I know you've talk, spoken about your relationship with the Lord being key to the overflow but is there one piece that you would say that was the lynch pinch? Yeah, I think for me, it's it's really mindset. It's just that mindset adjustment because I was so ingrained. You know, my old mindset was so ingrained. And it was like I had my own lid. I had my own ceiling in my life that I couldn't. I could say the words, all things are possible. But I'm like, yeah, all things are possible. And other than these things, you know, I mean, yeah. other than. I'm not going to slam dunk a basketball, you know, there's things like that. But I remember sitting in an audience one time in a big auditorium and I saw all these people that had done incredible things. And I was just like, man, if they could do it, I could do it. And I started to feel that way about more and more things that if they could do it, then I could do it. And it's really when all things are possible through Christ who strengthens me. I really begin to understand that if that's my assignment, then nothing is going to hold me back from it other than me. And I'm not going to give someone else the power to hold me back. Right. And so that's when it really, I kind of got that download that, yeah, I have to become a top money earner in, in whatever company. I can become an officer in the military. I can become an author. I can become a pastor if I wanted to. Like I took away those limits. And that's a very, very empowering day because I, I spent most of my life with all these, these left and right limits. And I was kind of stuck in the box, you know, yeah. and I had to continue to believe and just read the stories. You know, Jim Rohn once said, through testimonials and personal experience, we have enough information to conclude that it's possible to design and live an extraordinary life. And he said that if you'll change, everything can change for you. And I was like, oh, and it was just so empowering to know that I have, I made choices, you know, because we're all, we're all born naked and afraid, right? 
equally. And along the way, some people develop a confident mindset and some people are shy and they just don't have that type of mindset. And so I was fortunate to have great parents who always said to do anything, which helped me because now that I've been in the world and gotten to know a lot of people, I, I see how hard of an obstacle that is for a lot of people to pass when their parents say, you know, good, nothing, you know, and then they have a hard time getting past that because that's the boundaries and things that were, what were put on. But that, that really helped me a lot is just hearing it, being around people who've done it. And I think that's been so powerful just to have people speak those words. I was at a, I was a sergeant in the army and I hadn't finished college yet. And I remember one time I was, I was at this training and they said, talk about the army values for five minutes. So I got up and I did my best speech I could. And later that guy took the time to come to me and he said, have you ever thought about being an officer in the military? Cause the way you just did that was just as good as any officer I've ever heard. And those words, those seeds came in and they went in down deep and I couldn't stop thinking about it. And from that point on, I was like, maybe I should, maybe I am worthy enough to become an officer in the military. Maybe I could go back and finish college. Maybe I could get all these waivers and do all these things and, and go do it. And I did. And I would say that sergeant was a big reason why. Tell us a little bit about yeah. your your yeah your military days and how that shaped who you are today. Man, so, you know, it changes you for sure. And what's funny is I went into the military right out of high school for three years. So I was in from 18 to 21, got out of the military, and I went back in 11 years later at a lower rank than I got out. So now I'm 32, and I have, you know, some 20-year-olds bossing me around, which is very humbling, by the way. <laughs> Taking my tip. But the military is great because it teaches you camaraderie. You know, it, it, it levels the playing fields. I mean, when you go to basic training, they shave everybody's head. It doesn't matter your accent. It doesn't matter your color. I mean, we had, we had gangsters from Detroit becoming best friends from guys from West Virginia, and I couldn't even understand what they were saying when they were talking to each other. I'm like, only in the Army are these guys going to hang out and become besties, you know? And I was like, that is so cool. But the discipline you learn and just the, the brotherhood, you know, and it's like, I saw a guy speak the other day and, and there was a one, the one big battle it's in the movie Lone Survivor. They had one Navy SEAL stuck in this valley and they sent a thousand people in there to save this one guy, all knowing that they could lose their lives to go rescue the one, you know? And I just thought, man, and, and all those guys were honored to do it because they're like, yes. And, and that gives you the confidence when you're in the military that, you know, if something bad happens to you, you got people that are going to come get you. And that's a, it's a beautiful thing. So it's, it's like a brotherhood. So you're in the military and you get out and you can kind of walk through a crowd and say, I think he's military. Right. And then when you find out someone is, you're like, okay, we can talk another language because a lot of people just don't under, um, don't understand until you're there. It shaped me for sure. And I was an athlete growing up. I wrestled from fourth grade through my senior year, full-time in the army for a little bit. So one-on-one -on -one sports, I think that does a lot, a lot of good for people too. And just confidence And the military was a, it was great. It was great to me. Enjoyed my 12 years there for sure. Yeah. Like you've, then you've gone from a military where you've got brotherhood to running a home business, a bit different there and creating some se great success in your home businesses. You've been right at the top of income earners in those companies. You've created great teams. What were the transferable skills and how did your book around happiness change your team's perspectives? Yeah. So for me, a lot of it was personal development. It was like a light switch for me. You know, whenever I think it was 2000, when uh, I, I met a guy and he said, oh man, have you read this book? You know, have you read how to win friends and influence people? I was like, nope, read that book. That book changed me. Have you read Think and Grow Rich? Nope. Read that book and that changed me. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki. Hadn't heard of him. Hadn't heard of any of that. And I just started soaking it up. I started listening to everything I could, reading everything I could. And every single one of those programs, books, everything, it just became a little bit of peace in me and it just made me a little better. And it made me better as a, as a soldier to lead troops, made me better in business to lead people. And I just really fell in love with learning leadership. And I still to this day can't get enough of it. I love that. Falling in love with learning. So good. Chad, you mentioned a little earlier about the 10 keys that you write in your book. So what do you feel like one of the 10 keys that people struggle with the most? I think discipline is so, so hard for people. And I, I usually, I put my hand up for that. I'm trying one. to remember the exact quote. It's Hebrews 12, 11. Oh, and here's how it goes. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. So most people are out on that, right? You're like, you're doing something that you don't have to do and it gets painful. Oh, I'm done. So, so no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it provides a harvest of peace and righteousness for those who have been trained by it. Yeah. So discipline is a great teacher, but you have to do it. 
I mean, I've done some hard, hard things. I, I did this program called 75 hard for 75 days. You do these like 10 things each and every day. And most people don't get through it. You know, in, in America for New Year's resolutions, over 80% of people give up on them within a couple of weeks. I mean, it's, and, and it's stuff, it's good stuff. It's like, Hey, I look in the mirror. I want to lose 20 pounds this year. About day five, it's like, oh, is it really worth skipping the pizza again? <laughs> you know? So it's it's just, it's challenging. The discipline piece is challenging, but it's absolutely instrumental. Anybody I know that operates at a high level in anything in life is very, very disciplined. And so it's just, it's it's part of, it's part of the puzzle, right? You got to put it together or you're just not going to have really what you want. There's no, there's no shortcuts, no way around it. I trained for, a, a, my buddy turned 50 and he, when he was 25, he did this, it's called a battalion death march. And it's 26.2 miles. You put a backpack on and you're going through sand. And then mile 20 through 22, they actually had a guy come in, a family come in, and they they paid however much money. So that two miles is sand that's deep like this, like very deep, like foot deep. Yeah. So you're going through this whole thing and I, there's no way we would have done it. So what we had to do is say, okay, it's, it's in March, beginning of the year, January, every Tuesday, we're going to go get on a treadmill together for at least an hour. Every Friday, we're going to do a longer and longer and longer. So we started at like 10 miles. The next Friday, 12, 14. We got all the way up to 20. And I had never in my life gone more than 15 miles. But it's it's the predict When you have discipline involved, the, the, the outcome becomes very predictable. Because, you know, if you put the card in the ATM machine, the money comes out. If you put in the effort and you put in the discipline and you execute the plan you have in place, you get the result because you know a thousand other people have gotten that result. So you know you'll get, you're going to get it too. I mean, it's it's very predictable, but it takes discipline. And your reasons, there's the hard part. There's a scale every morning when you wake up and your reasons to do it have to become higher than your excuses not to. And most people just don't build their reasons up enough. And so their excuses went out. And they yeah. instead of putting on the discipline shirt, they put on the non-discipline shirt that day. I think that's so powerful. Yeah. yeah, that's so powerful because, you know, like, like the reality is like mm -hmm. if you if you do a Google search on discipline, you're probably not going to get, you know, discipline to get results. You're probably not going to get as many articles and stuff like that if you put in an article, uh, if you put on in the search bar, how to get results quickly. People are looking for that instant gratification. People are looking for that, you know, I want results now. And, mm -hmm. and you know, and that's why people are falling victim to scammers and falling victim to... They want to get rich quick. Yeah. They want to get the results quick. They want to get everything yesterday. Yeah, so that's, yeah. yeah, that's a really, really powerful lesson. And, yeah, you're right. It hurts, you know. Like, yeah. if you were to, you know, like, if you look at the discipline, how would you, you know, just say you're working with someone in your team who's actually not a disciplined person. And, you know, that lack of discipline could be, you know, either modeling their parents, it could be ADHD, um, where they, you know, just don't have focus or things like that. What are some of the ways that you would say, hey, I'm going to mentor you and these are the things that I want you to do to maintain that discipline? Yeah, so, you know, there's a saying that friend taught me, he said, success begets success. So one discipline leads into the next discipline. So, Really, if you're if you're coming in with someone, first of all, you have to identify like what is serving them, like what what are they, what's moving them forward, and what's holding them back. And a lot of times, it's e when you remove something out of your life, you kind of have to you have to replace it. A lot of times, because there's a hole, right? When you say the word remove, removing stuff, so there's a hole. So when you remove it, you have to you have to replace it with something good. Like maybe that person eats pizza every Friday, and you're like, all right, no more pizza on Fridays. From now on, on Fridays, you're gonna eat steak instead of pizza. So we're replacing something better with something worse, you know, that they used to be bad and not serving that person. So it's, it's the small things. I mean, uh, uh, one guy wrote a book called make your bed, you know, how hard is it really just to wake up in the morning and make your bed, but see psychology, the, the psychology behind it, you wake up and you make your bed. You're like, I just accomplished something. I made my bed. What can I do next? And then next thing you know, you're doing two, three, four things. And so, and, and then you start exercising. So now you have more energy. Now you're doing five, six, seven things. And then next thing you know, you're getting more done by Wednesday than you do in a whole week. And then next thing you know, maybe you're getting more done on Monday than you did in a whole week. And it's just all, it's the snowball. But it starts with just, you know, you can get the whiteboard One out. Thing. These things are for me. These things are not for me. Yeah. And just understanding the difference. Yeah. So take account of where you are and where you want to be. You, you've been through the military and you mentioned that you've had this whole like discipline. You learned all this discipline yourself. You managed to develop that um, mindset. For someone who's not in the military, 
what steps could they take to start to actually develop that disciplined mindset? Yeah, so one thing I like to say is it's okay to be a copycat if you copy the right cat, right? So what do you want? You can start with what do you want? I want to be, I want to lose 20 pounds. Who do you know that's lost 20 pounds before? Pick, pick three or four people that you know lost 20 pounds. Okay, buy them lunch and say, what did you do to lose 20 pounds? Tell me step by step, how long did it take you? What did you change about your life? Because then what you're getting is you're getting evidence and you're getting facts and you're getting a game plan all at the same time. And then if you're serious, you just do what they did and then you're going to get what they got. Yeah. Like it's a pretty simple philosophy, right? It's like, if you want to have what you've never had, you have to do what you've never done. There's just no other way around it. It's just the way it is. Yeah. And, and, you know, if we look at, for instance, NLP, one of the modalities we're trained in, NLP is all around modeling behavior yeah. and modeling excellence. So, you know, it, it's so in, important. Chad, just as we draw to an end, what's next for you? What's, what's your next chapter? It's a great question because I'm always like, what am I going to do when I grow <laughs> up, right? What's this next season have? So I'm always just, man, I'm, I'm like just always in morning, like praying, like, what do you have for me, Lord? I want to I mean, tell me the next step. Give me my daily bread. You know, what am I going to attack today? Give me something to attack. And I always feel like he'll give me something. And I just go for that. I attack it. I attack it. I attack it until I feel like it's time to pivot or there's something better, right? Because God always wants exceeding, exceedingly more than I want for myself. So my, pro my prayer is let my will for my life line up with your will for my life. Because the reason you made me is much better than what I think I'm made right. for. So help me to continue to make those slight adjustments, understanding that like a rocket ship on the way to the moon drifts, you know, it's off course and you always need to adjust to get back on track. So I call it the slipstream. Sometimes you're going through life and you, and you're like, you're like, man, I know I am right where I'm supposed to be right now in this moment. And then maybe two weeks later, you're like, I feel so far off track right now. What is going on? To me, it's always plugging back into the source and just saying, you know, Lord, teach me, guide me. What do you have next? And that's the safest, best place any human can be has been my experience. Amen. What advice would you give to someone that, you know, I don't, I'm i stuck. I don't have the discipline. I don't have And they really want to rewrite their life story. Yeah. So, you know, the why is always so much better than how. Uh, you know, like it, it's the story. There's a guy, he weighed like 400 pounds. He knew he needed to lose weight. He knew his health. All the doctors had said, hey, you're going to die way too young if you don't lose some weight. So... He lose 50 and he gained it back. He lose 50 and he gained it back. And one day he took his daughter out for lunch and she was there having lunch and she passed out. And they're like, oh my gosh. And they, they rush her to the emergency room and they find out real quick she has a kidney that's failing and her dad is a match. But guess what? He can't give his own daughter his kidney because he's too dangerous because he's too far away. So this father says, what do I need to do? I need to give my kidney. And they said, you'd have to lose like 100 pounds in 90 days to give, be able to give your kidney. And guess what? All the other times he had a hard time losing the 50, he gained it back, lose 50, gained it back. Do you, do you think that father maybe easily lost the 100 pounds this time because he had enough reasons to do it? Of course he did. He lost it, gave his daughter his kidney, and uh, far as I know, kept the weight off. So again, it just goes back to having a, a strong, some people say have a why that makes you cry, right? I mean, some of the healthiest people are some who, they survive their first heart attack and you see they get real healthy real fast. Mm -hmm. And so it just has to, someone needs to come on, you know, you gotta, hopefully someone comes along in your life and knocks you over the head a little bit and turns you on. But if someone never does come along, you got to figure that out for yourself and just find out what you want, make it important enough. And that's the only way anybody ever gets there is it becomes very, very important. So for me, like a quick story, I was in the army and I was in Afghanistan and my two-year-old got really, really sick. And I wanted more than anything at that moment in time to go straight home to be with my family. But because I was in the army and because of my commitments, I had to stay there because I had to fly. I was in the airport when I found out. I'm like, reroute my flight, please. My son could die. And they said, well, you're in charge of these six guys. We need you to come back here, fill out some paperwork, turn in your weapon. And by the time I did all that and got back to that same airport, two days had gone by. So now my whole flight home in my mind, I'm retiring from the military because I'm like, that is never going to happen. I put myself in a position where when my wife and son needed me the most, I couldn't do it. That's not ever going to happen again. 7,300 miles from home. So on that whole flight home, I'm like, I'm getting out. So you can believe me when I say I dabbled in network marketing, you know, in business. And I sat the next month in that chair and I looked at everything through a whole different lens. Of, this has to replace my income. 
And we went from like two grand the next month, nine grand, next month over 20 and the next month over 40. And so we easily replaced my 8,000 a month from the army. And I put in a packet and I got out early 2014. And so I've been a full-time entrepreneur since, but that's what led up to that was a big why just a, something that life came and smacked me around a little bit. And I said, I, I'm not getting smacked like that again. No, no. Yep. Now your book, the 10 steps, well, how did you come up with that concept and, and what made you actually put pen to paper? Yeah. So I think, I, I don't know how many years ago it was when I first started, I had a friend who wrote a book, first of all. And I thought if my friend wrote a book, I know I could write a book. So I, I've been intimidated by different things in life. Like I was intimidated to become an army officer because I thought I could never do that. I'd have to finish college and get a degree. And so a friend of mine wrote a book and I started thinking, huh, I should, I should think about it. And he said, you should write one. And so years, and I, I had this idea of finding happy because for me, when I was younger, I battled with depression. Uh, I was just very, very, I, I was at a point in life where I kind of would say I was hopeless. I didn't have hope for anything. And, and just very, I was suicidal at one point. And so getting through all that and getting on the other side of that, I thought, oh my gosh, I know I've, I've been through it. I've, I've, I've traveled the, the trail and I know what it means to go from being very depressed to very happy. And so this idea of finding happy, which really is, is finding joy. But I thought if I use the word happy, I'll get everyone to read it. So it's like also kind of a covert mm -hmm. evangelism tool, you know? And for me, I wrote the book that I wish someone would have gave me when I was in like my twenties. Cause if I would have read that book, I would have saved myself a lot of time. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. much. That's awesome. Chad. Now, if people want to get a copy of your book, we'll have the links on our podcast notes and they can um, go, or go to Amazon and order it directly. You can look up Chad. Chad, how do I pronounce your surname, Chad? Canella. Just like not. Yeah. Chad Canella, and you can get his book, but you could also get his link directly in our show notes. Chad, I want to end this program. We do this sometimes. Um, sometimes we don't, but we want to end the program if you could pray for for our audience today that are struggling to really get a strong why and then put the discipline around that. Absolutely. I would love to, for sure. Father God, Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity. Lord, I know there's people listening to this right now that are, in fact, struggling in life, Lord, and they know they want a different life, Lord. They know they want to be healthier. They know they want to be more successful, Father, but they just haven't been able to put it all together. And I just pray today, Father, you would give them the courage, Lord. I give, pray you give them the courage to do things they've never done before in their life. And in that faith walk, as they take a step, Father, towards you and towards the best life that you have for them, Lord, and, and the destiny and calling, the very reason that you created them, Father, that they would walk towards that, take that one step in boldness. And I pray, Lord, that just that one third of 1% each and every day, they would just move and they would just change Father, and they would become exactly who you created and designed them to be, Lord. And I just take authority over the atmosphere in their life right now, and I bind up every demonic spirit in Jesus' name. And Lord, and just ask that you would silence the enemy, Father God, and you would give them strategies to move forward, Lord, and put on the full armor in Ephesians 6, Lord, and to walk in strength towards anything that you call them to, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Chad, it's been great having you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you guys, man. I love you guys. Love getting to know you. It's always a blessing for me to talk with you both. You know, when I think of speaking to Chad and I think about mm -hmm. his areas of discipline and, and his, his conversation around discipline, it really makes me wonder, is that actually where a lot of people are failing in rewriting the story? Because sometimes, you know, the, the instant gratification, we don't actually put the work towards it. You know, and, and yeah. you know, like, do we want quick and easy or do we want that delayed gratification? And I, I know, like, if I look at me, you know, you know, when we look at, you know, the modalities we use, there are instances where there can be rapid change, yes. you know, and there can be instances where there actually is a working and of your change. I think Paul said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You know, and I think there's, yeah. you know, even though when we accept Christ, we're saved in an instance, there's a journey as yes. well of the working out. Absolutely. You know, I just feel like a lot of the times that circled up a change, it's happening because the people have been putting in the work without actually thinking about it so much or getting caught up in that whole pain of the discipline. So by the time they come to the change, it's like, where does that time go? You know, it's like, yeah, okay. it just seems so quick, you know? Um, it seems to have happened just instantly because they haven't actually thought about, they've just been 
committed to the actual discipline, committed to the routine, committed to doing what they need to do. And before they realize it, it's there. Yeah, yeah. It's like totally get it. It's like the the, the book or the theory that you've got to put 10,000 hours into something to actually gain mastery. And sometimes we could actually be putting in the work unconsciously. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know what I mean? Like people say, oh, wow, you've done this and, and you've done that and you've achieved this. But they're like, hang on, we've been working at this for 20, you must be lucky. I'm like, hey, no, no, no. Luck. <laughs> luck's not nothing to do with luck's it. Luck's not nothing to do with that sweat, tears, and, yeah. and more tears. Um, <laughs> discipline is definitely one of the key areas that probably we don't speak enough about. Yeah. And, and I really thank Chad for... Yeah. highlighting that in, in today's episode. Yeah. Thank you for joining us on the Rewrite Your Story podcast. We hope you found this episode enlightening. For more information on the topics discussed, please visit our website at stephenandsharling.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your favourite platform. Share it with your friends and follow us on social media at Stephen and Charlene. Until next time, stay informed and inspired. This is Stephen and Charlene signing off from the Rewrite Your Story podcast. Thank you and stay blessed. Stay blessed.